to wander. Um, last week, many of you know, I was in Washington, D.C. I was doing Barb Gomez's funeral um, at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, Barb uh, was a beach setter and would miss her tremendously. And the service was on Friday. And, and, and Friday morning, I decided I would, I would go for a run, and which feels really hard to say now, <laughs> considering, you know, the just things going on. But I decided to go for a run Friday morning. And I got up early. And I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll throw my running stuff on. But I'm going to take the subway into Washington. I was staying in Northern Virginia. And then run back. It was about a six and a half, seven mile run back. And so I took the subway in. And those of you who, who've known me for a while know I, I, I kind of like my space. I like my personal space. I hug now because I've, I, I'm living in Florida and I've gotten used to hugging. But I'm, I'm, I'm very Scandinavian, very Midwestern. You know, I, I like, you know, my space and the ideal position to talk to somebody is they're standing next to you and you're both looking at some random place in the distance and, you know, having your conversation. And uh, I'm, uh, you New Yorkers, that it stands so close. That's disconcerting for this guy from Minnesota. And so, you know, I, I like to have my space. And so I get on the subway. And you know when you enter um, anything, you do this quick mental calculus. And I looked over the subway because I thought I don't want to sit next to somebody because I think that's kind of weird. You know, and so I thought if, if there are, well, I do, I'm just, uh, that's me, you know. But I thought, you know, I'd like to sit down if there's an open seat where there's two seats and I can sit by myself. And I quickly scanned and I saw that everybody was sitting in a seat and there were open seats, but there weren't open two seats. And just as I did that, I made eye contact with a lady. And I had what I can only describe as a Seinfeldian moment, where it was this awkwardness of, I made eye contact with this woman, and I did this, I got on the subway, and I did that, and then stood like this, and then I realized she probably thinks I'm not sitting down because of her, which wasn't the case. But then, for the next few minutes, I proceeded to worry, I wonder if she's looking at me. I mean, I just, I want my space. And I stood there, and the worst part was that at the next subway stop, somebody got on and stood right next to me right in my space and it's, so it was an incredibly uncomfortable ride and people like me we say I just need my space right I had that moment because I would say to you well I just need my space I just need my space and the reality is do I need my space or do I want my space well obviously I want my space I've ridden subways in a number of different places and if you go to a place like Hong Kong and I remember, you know, we were standing, we were packed in like sardines, and then another 50, 60 people would get on and you stop. I don't know how they did that. And you go to a place like Stockholm, Sweden, and in the subway, oh, it's just perfect. Perfectly manicured. Nobody's making eye contact. They're all sitting properly and quietly. It was just beautiful. So I would be somebody that I would say, I need my space. But the reality is that's a want and not a need. And this morning we're going to talk about the next part of the Lord's Prayer. And so if you would open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, I'm going to go ahead and read as, as Mike follows along, or Logan, no, it's Mike, um, as they follow along. But I'm going to read, uh, th this is Jesus speaking, and uh, I'm going to read from verse 5 through uh, verse 11. And I'm reading the New Living Translation. So open up your Bibles. Um, you got electronically, it's up on the screen. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. You can also uh, look on version. If you've got the version Bible app, you can pull that up and look for events, and it will bring up our sermon notes and our scripture readings. And so this is Jesus speaking, and uh, he begins by saying, when you pray. And as we've talked about the last month and a half, it's when, not if. Okay, when you pray. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they'll ever get. But when you pray... Go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. Instead, pray like this. And Jesus now begins to introduce what we now call the Lord's Prayer. He says, Our Father in heaven... May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we're adding today this verse. Give us today the food we need. Now, the more translation or the more traditional translation is what? Give us this day our daily bread. 
Okay. Give us this day our daily bread. And let me find my little clicker there. Okay, let's take us to the next slide. Okay, so the, 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 the traditional rendering is give us this day our daily bread. And um, that's what it literally says. Um, the food we need, the arton epusion. Okay, literally um, your daily share of bread. Now, um, the, the, we translate it, or they translate it in the New Living Translation, the food we need, uh, food, bread, uh, whatever the case, there is a daily allotment that you need to survive, right? And Jesus is saying, you ought to pray for that. Um, what's interesting is this is where um, the focus here shifts to first person. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, in the first few petitions, it's been all about God, okay? Your name be holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. And then here we shift from, from, uh, from third person, that is, we're, we're speaking about God and praying things of God, to now first person. God, okay, we want your name to be holy. We want your kingdom to come. We want your will to be done. And, and, but today we need, we need that daily sustenance. Please give us what we need to get by. Please give us our daily bread. In fact, this is the only part of the prayer where we ask for things. You could say, well, asking for forgiveness, got it. But I, I'm saying in terms of material stuff, this is the only part of the prayer. There's, um, by some counts, uh, depending on how you number them, seven petitions. And the first three petitions are about God. This fourth petition is uh, about provision. It's about God providing for us in our daily life. And then the last three um, petitions are forgiveness, temptation, delivery from evil. They're all um, dealing with a person's own spiritual life. Forgive us. Help us to forgive. Don't lead us toward temptation. Lead us away from it. And uh, deliver us from evil. Okay, in this case, though, we're asking for our daily sustenance. Uh, one commentary I read um, said a good translation would be, give us today the bread necessary for our existence. And let me just take a little, little bit of a time out. You might think, well, why is it so hard to translate it? And again, remember, the New Testament was written in Greek. Greek is a much more complex uh, complex and uh, a much richer language in English. In, in many cases, in Greek, they have four or five words for something for which we have one word. I've used love as an example, and there are other examples as well. But they may have four or five different words to describe a different variant of it. Not to mention every Greek word, um, the ending tells you what part of speech. And I know some of you are going, we did not come to church to do English class. Got it. Okay, we're almost done with that part. But every Greek word has an ending which tells you, does it belong to me, the, they, who does it belong to? We, in English, just know from context. And so oftentimes when you read different commentaries or read footnotes in your Bible, they may kind of elaborate on it because the Greek is that much richer than how we translate in English. And so one, one person translates it um, saying, give us today the bread necessary for our existence. The bottom line is, Jesus is saying, it's okay ask God for these material things. Now, there's a, there's a line here. And I think the line is, is the difference between what we need versus what we want. Jesus doesn't say, give us this day our, our daily Ferrari, right? Give us this day our daily lottery. Give us this day our daily, you know, extra house. N not that those are bad things. And, and, you know, I guess we can have a theological debate about whether or not you should ever pray for those things. Um, I, I'm going to side right now saying we probably shouldn't. <laughs> but what Jesus is talking about specifically here is those things you need. Okay, you need food to survive. And it's not only okay to pray for it. Jesus tells us, pray for your daily sustenance. God delights in blessing you. God doesn't give you everything you want. How many of you have ever had kids? Okay. Now keep your hands up if you gave them everything they asked for. Okay, didn't see any hands. You, you know as a parent that I, I love giving my kids gifts. I love it when I give my kids things. But I also don't want them to be complete wretches. And I know that if I give them everything they feel that they want, it's not going to be good for them. And so God, on the one hand, delights in blessing us, but doesn't give us everything we want. He always answers prayers. But God sees the big picture. In Matthew chapter 7, and I've got that uh, scripture up on the screen as well. 
your remarks on, on God and enjoying blessing us, and he says, if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? God wants good things for you. Now, your spiritual growth doesn't mean that only good things happen. After all, the guy preaching was in the hospital last week. Yes, we as Christians, we get sick. We get old. We get hurt. We lose our jobs. We have financial deprivation. All of those things happen to Christians. That is part of being a Christian in this world. And yet, there's this paradox. A paradox is holding two opposing thoughts together at the same time. There's this paradox. God loves blessing you. God wants to bless you. Maybe not in the way that you see he should bless you. Maybe not in the way you want, but in what you need. So Jesus here is commanding us. He's telling us to ask for daily sustenance. And later on, he, he, he tells us, as, as we just read, that God is much better at giving good gifts than people. And so I, th I think there is the distinction between the prosperity gospel, which says, if you believe, you will receive, and whatever you want, you get, if you have enough faith. That's not biblical. Versus, God likes to bless you. Now, he will give you what you need and what he wants you to have, not necessarily what you want. But he does enjoy blessing you. And so in, in that light, we ought to pray for his daily provision, those things we need to survive. And the question is, what do we need to survive? And this is an interesting question because, um, you know, in the 21st century, what we need is maybe different than what we perceive we needed even 100 years ago. 50 years ago, 25 years ago? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I'll ask you to think, do you need your smartphone? You shake your heads. I, I sometimes feel like my work mandates it in both the Army and the church. Do I need it? I don't, I don't need it. But today, if I don't respond to emails within a couple days, it's just different. Okay, so our perception of what we need, and I'm not, by the way, just time out. I'm not saying you do need a smartphone, okay? I'm just saying that our perception of what we need to get by in this society is different. For example, I'll ask another one. Do you need a car in Palm Coast? You kind of do. You kind of do. Now, I, I don't think that Jesus is telling us, therefore, you ought to pray for your daily car, right? But you, you need a car to get around, we, we, live in a, we live in an area where it's a lot more difficult to get around if you don't have transportation, and we don't really have public transportation. But I'm not talking about that. I, you know, I'm not talking about that kind of a need. What do we actually need? What is Jesus talking about here? Well, the most obvious thing is food. Give us this day our daily bread. We're called to pray for our sustenance. Jesus directly commands it here. The rest of the things that I'm going to talk about tie into survival, but food is the most obvious thing. Jesus says, pray for your daily portion of bread. He points to scripture, uh, places in scripture, um, or I'm going to point to places, um, excuse me, I'm going to point to places in scripture where those things are addressed, but here Jesus is pointing us directly to food. Pray each day for your daily bread. And I think we have to understand what he's asking when we pray this. Food doesn't exist in a vacuum. Here's what I mean by that. The people of Israel received manna from heaven. Was Jesus expecting that we would not work when we pray, give us this day our daily bread? Does anybody do that? Does anybody say, well, you know, the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread, and so God's going to provide, so I'm not going to go to work. That would be ridiculous, right? We, 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 I think you understand from context, you understand from Jesus, you understand from your own actions, you understand from the actions of the disciples. Nobody's talking about God providing bread from heaven as he did for the people of Israel miraculously and beautifully. We're talking about something different. Although that would be crazy. That would be awesome if I, I just said, you know, our, um, our feeding plan for our kids is, is to wait upon God to give manna. And if it's in the front yard, the kids can go eat. If not, you know, sorry, guys, you know, I guess you're going to be hungry tonight. You know, that would, be, uh, that would be interesting. But that's not what Jesus is asking us to pray for. He's saying, give us this day our daily bread, which by definition means he's asking us to pray for things like work. 
because we're not asking for manna. And so it's okay to pray about work. We get food through our labors. Again, can't hit this home enough. We are not praying for manna. Give us this day our daily bread. How do you get your daily bread? You get your daily bread through work. I think in our society we're, we're disconnected from that. When Jesus was, was teaching this prayer, your labor equaled work. You either harvested food on your own or you would most likely barter. There was obviously money, but you were much closer to my work equals sustenance. Do you ever think about that? You know, we, we live in this electronic society where we swipe a card. If we go through a drive through we, we swipe a card. And do you ever think about the fact that, let's say you make 20 bucks an hour, that McDonald's costs you half an hour of work. Another three hours of misery after that, but that's a different story. Okay, you'll be, I get sad when I eat McDonald's. I, I just, I, I feel like my world is coming to an end. I eat it and it tastes so good. And then I feel profoundly disturbed for a couple hours afterwards. And um, I realize I didn't actually put food in my body but that's not the sermon. We're, we're disconnected from that. But when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're asking God to provide for us through work as well. Let me, uh, let me give you a couple of verses. 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. It's up on the screen. Paul says this, Even while we were with you, we gave you this command. Those unwilling to work will not get to eat. Paul says, yet we hear that some of you are living idle lives, refusing to work and meddling in other people's business. We command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. Let me say a couple things about this. The first is, is the, the disclaimer. Paul here is not talking about somebody that is physically unable to work, somebody that's retired, somebody that's widowed, somebody that, that can't provide for themselves. In fact, the disciples, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this, the disciples actually set aside their own laborers to provide for those who couldn't um, in the, the distribution of, the, of the, the bread to the widows. So Paul isn't talking about that. He's talking about somebody that's able-bodied but, but simply unwilling to work. And he commands them, you need to get to work. It, it would be ridiculous to pray, give us this day our daily bread, and then sit and wait for somebody to give us this day our daily bread. And so praying for food is naturally connected to, Lord, give us work. But that also means, and this is the second part, that Christianity values work. It does. I, I know that sometimes the, the old Puritan work ethic, that idea of the, the, the Christian pilgrims coming over or the Puritans coming over and, and working hard, that maybe that gets overblown. But that is a part of what we believe. We believe that it is good to work. We believe that we ought to work. We believe that we ought to earn a living. We believe that we ought to provide uh, for ourselves and for others. And so those two things, one, Paul isn't talking about those unable to work. Notice he says unwilling. Not unable, unwilling. Okay, so please do not, you know, send me an email and say, well, I, I can't work because I'm retired. I got, got it, got it. But Paul says those unwilling to work. He's really talking about people my age that just don't want to work and just want to live off others. And the, the second verse I want to draw your attention is the job God gave Adam Right after Critium, and this is, by the way, for you Bible scholars, this is before the fall. After the fall, work became tedious. But notice that Adam's job was before the fall. Work is a good thing. Work is a blessed thing. It says, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend it and watch over it. And so as Christians, we believe that work is a good thing. It became difficult after the fall as part of the punishment. But work is a good thing. And so we ought to pray for it. And so I think in, in, encapsulated in this prayer, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just food, but work. It's okay. Lord, I want to do well at my work. I want to be prosperous at it. I want to be a good salesperson. I want to be a good teacher. I want to be a good fill in the blank for what you do. That is an appropriate thing to pray for. And remember, as we look at the Lord's Prayer, we're not saying those words are the only way we ought to pray. What we're saying is that Jesus is laying down a template for what we ought to pray for and how we ought to pray. We pray for food. We pray for work. And work requires, and it's ironic that I wrote this sermon for last week, work requires help. Y'all have been there, haven't you? You don't feel good? You're sick? 
you got a broken leg, you got something going on preventing you from doing your daily duties. This is such a, a frequent theme throughout Jesus' ministry. People often came up to him for healing. The blind, the lame, the sick, the dying. And I, you know, I think about that society. That was a day and an age when if you couldn't work, you were totally dependent on others. Nowadays, we have welfare, we have Social Security, we have Medicare, we have Medicaid, and I, we're not going to get into a political debate about, about those, but we have ways our society provides for those who are physically unable or have reached an age where they're no longer going to work. And that's a great thing. I think it's a good thing. Um, but they didn't back then. And so people knew the premium of good health way more than we do. If you were a leper, if you were blind, if you were lame in any way, you sat by the city gate and hopefully somebody would give you some money. Hopefully somebody would give you some food. Hopefully somebody would have some compassion. But if you didn't work, there was no way to have food without somebody else giving it to you. And so part of that prayer then is praying for healing. I've been a pastor for now close to a couple decades. And I'll tell you, I haven't seen a pattern to healing. I don't think there's a, a, a special way to pray. That if you pray this way, the person always gets healed. Sometimes people have, have experienced, I've seen, miraculous immediate healing. Others have been healed over time. Others have been healed through medicine. And others have been prayed for, and they still die. In fact, all people who are healed die, right? Lazarus is not still running around. I hope you know. He was raised from the dead. So all people who are prayed for eventually die. So I, don't, I haven't seen in my ministry a rhyme or reason to healing. But what I believe is that healing is a chance for God to be glorified and for people to come to faith and for people to understand their dependence on God. Let me take a little bit of a, a time out um, that isn't in my sermon. Um, as many of you know, um, a lot of my self-identity is wrapped up in, in, in physicality being able to run, being in the army, being physically fit. I ran seven miles on Saturday and Sunday morning. I couldn't stand. What does that do to your ego? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> it's not good. It's, it's, it's not good at all. So part of the conversation I've had with God is I've heard him saying to me, your identity needs to be more in me. It needs to be more in God, not in myself. So God is kind of checking my ego right there. And I think that in many ways, praying for healing is finding our identity is ultimately in Jesus. I, I need God because I lack. Here's uh, Luke chapter 17. I've got eight verses. And Michael, follow along on the, the screen there. Luke chapter 17, verses 11 and 19. It says, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. Let me take a quick time out. If you had leprosy in those days, uh, because it was considered to be a contagious skin disease, you were an outcast. You were an exile. And you only got food if somebody brought it to you the city gate or something like that. And so... They, in being healed, were also given the opportunity to work and the opportunity to earn their bread. One of them, this is verse 15, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Samaritans, the outcasts in Israel, they were considered to be, by their terms, half-breeds. They were not true Jews, they were not true Israelites. And so they were outcasts in our society, and he was the only one that thanked Jesus. Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. So what is the result? The result is faith. The, faith is, er, the result is glorification of God. Faith and glory. That's the opportunity that we have when God heals or works through our lives to heal us. They could now work. They could now provide for themselves. I think we've lost that aspect of healing just like we've lost the aspect that, that our work provides food 
um, because everything is so medical, and I thank God for the medical system. I thank God that I am able to go and get a couple different opinions on my back. Um, that is truly a gift from God. But sometimes what happens is we become disconnected from the fact that at the end of the day, it's all on God. Our health, our healing, our livelihood, our provision is all on God. So we need health. The last thing is we need people. And I'm going to talk about this briefly. But we need each other. Now, I, it may be a bit of a stretch to say, Jesus, he, I don't think he's telling us to pray for relationships or friendships necessarily. I think that would be a bit of a stretch in the context of, of Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. But we do need others. I referenced earlier in Acts 6, we see the creation of a specific ministry to provide fair distribution of the food to the widows. The church took care of the people within it. Now, our economic system is different today, but we do the same thing. We take care of each other, whether it's through a Habitat house, whether it's through the government, whether it's through a food pantry, whether it's through a mission trip, whether it's through the helping fund we have here at Beachside, whether it's through things like Sunday school curriculum. It, it, it isn't given to us free. You provide it for the kids we're raising up in the faith. We're in this together, and we take care of each other. And we ought to pray for chances to help each other. But also, we ought to pray for the opportunity to turn to each other when we need help. I said this during the announcements, but it was cool that some of you came and visited me at the hospital. And uh, for somebody who's got uh, just a little bit of pride, <laughs> a lot of pride maybe, um, for somebody who's used to visiting other people, um, to be the person being visited is, is definitely kind of shifting things around. But thank God for that. Thank God that we are in a community where we care about each other. And, and that is our, that's our sort of intrinsic response, is, is we want to help and care for each other. I want to tie this all together with looking at, at the challenge for us as Christians. And, uh, and this is where we're going to kind of end it. The challenge is, in praying for our daily bread, is the higher level of comfort and expectation in our culture. That rages against us. It rages against life being simple. It fights against our understanding we're dependent upon God. I was um, talking to the kids the other day, and um, I forget how they said it, but they made a comment. I think it was Wes who made the comment about, well, when you were a kid, you couldn't just listen to whatever music you wanted. Meaning, nowadays, you can download whatever you want on the computer you carry around in your pocket. And that's one simple example. But we've gotten used to such a high level of comfort in our society that going back to this prayer, give us this day our daily bread. Give us today the food we need. It almost seems old-fashioned. Kind of quaint. Kind of yesterday. Because we have everything, we think. We think. We have everything. We have the world at our fingertips. But if we don't understand our dependence on God, we have none of it. And so Jesus says that we are to humble ourselves to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Because you are a mirage or not, creature comforts or not, you're dependent upon God. And so when we pray, give us this day our daily bread, we're praying for food, we're praying for work, we're praying for health, we're praying for the people around us, and we're reminded that it is God doing the providing. So I end with this question. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? If you don't, there will be tension, because life is going to be all about you and what you can or can't do. But if you believe it, if you accept it, if you pray it, you'll find a sense of peace that the world isn't, in fact, about you. And there is incredible freedom and blessing in that. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? And we're going to pray. And as we finish praying, I invite you to profess your faith. We're going to use the words of the Apostles' Creed, and it will be on the screen in front of you. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for your provision. 
You tell us, Jesus, to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. A reminder that we're completely dependent upon you for food, for work, for health, for even the people to our left and right. We are not islands. We rely upon you. And so remind us again this morning to trust in you even more fervently, with more joy, with greater peace, knowing that you are the one providing. I pray, Lord, for each and every person here, that this morning as we go our separate ways, that you'd guide us and lead us this week. We pray in advance of next week for those who are going to come that have not yet come, for those who will visit, for those who will be introduced to you, to those who might be brought back to a relationship with you. We lift it up and we thank you for what you're going to do through this group of people. Lord, be with us now as we go out about our separate ways. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's